My name is Emil vidal Carr, and I've been, been in the fashion industry for 20 years. I'm a husband, I'm a father, I'm a brother and a son. So Emil, I've had the pleasure of knowing you now for about six years. And yeah. if I remember correctly, it was, our first encounter was um, on a winter's evening. In 2017, yeah, um, you were hosting some sort of presentation, and a mutual friend of, of ours invited me and said that there's a young Sierra Leonean designer that um, I'm sure you get on with, well with, and yeah. you have to meet him. And I was like, okay, fine, we'll go along. And um, indeed, I met you, and I was, I think, I was more intrigued that mm. I was going to meet another Sierra Leonean because, yeah. as you know, Sierra Leoneans were few and far between. Yeah. <laughs> and then when I finally met you and realised that your, your surname was Carr, I knew that even within the minority of being a Sierra Leonean, you were then part of a small tribe of Sierra Leoneans mm -hmm. called the Korean people. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about your upbringing in a Sierra Leonean home and how you got to where you are now. Uh, I, I mean, mum and dad always spoke to us in Creole, like proper Creole. <laughs> and then as kids, me and Joe, my sister, we always responded back in English. Because um, we were born in Freetown, we kept, well, I came here when I was three, I think Joe was about seven, maybe seven and a half. So we, you can say we were pretty much brought, brought up over here. Um, so I maybe started speaking bits of Creole when I was, when I was three, but it was nowhere near enough to fully embrace the language. So um, I've always spoken back to mum and dad in English and then they speak to us in Creole. And that was just the, the di dynamics of our household. Uh, Mum and dad always cooked the food. They refused to cook anything English. So we had like rice, which was, I think a good 15 years every day. Some form of rice, whether it's jollof rice or plain rice or fried rice. And um, yeah, I, I say I was very much bought. Our household was Sierra Leone in the middle of London. And then once you leave the house, you're, I guess, exposed to the different cultures around in London. So, yeah, it was um, a very strict household. Um, at times, a, a bit too strict to, to deal with. I, I think in the early years, I didn't quite understand my, my dad in particular. Um, but I, I think uh, a lot of the way he brought us up was partially through fear and not wanted, want, wanting us to it encounter bad things that would ruin our lives. And, and I guess with African parents, they uh, look on things from an extreme point of view and um, they would rather not ri you risk or have you face the risks and things go bad than things go good. Excellent. So it's a very rich culture. Yeah. I'm proud to be so lean in myself. Yeah, it's a very funny culture. It is. <laughs> and I, I know that you and I have a lot of banter about yeah. it. So... Let's let's um let's invite some of your guests to hear some of that okay. banter. <laughs> Can you? Um, <laughs> it'll be really good to to see this lighter side of you. Yeah. Um, could you say anything in Korea, or would you would you want me to? to... Well, I, I can say the basics. <laughs> okay. So let's have a little dialect. All right. Dialect. Cool. All right. Good show, Andrew. I did. I body. Ah, not bad, Emil. I'm glad you put it with you today. How how you feel right now? Yeah, I'm feeling good. Um, yeah, the, the, the body fine. That's good. Excellent. <laughs> Tempo <Temple> too. <laughs> so let's talk business, Emil. Mm. So you've been in the business now for 20 years. Yeah. Um, I'm sure you've seen a lot of people come and go. Uh, there's been a lot of changes. And more yeah. recently, we're hearing a lot of words such as Brexit, mm. sustainability. How is the uncertainty of the country as well as the industry yeah. treating you as a company? Well, well, whenever there's any kind of change, whether it's Brexit or COVID or anything, you, mean, you, you know that the prices are going to go up. And the way I kind of approach business is that I, I don't let anything kind of fear me because when I have been in that stage, it's almost crippling. So I kind of approach things with a, with a very much a tunnel vision and uh, just having that kind of rugged confidence that my way is the, the right way. And I just have to fight my way through it because there's always going to be that obstacle that will uh, challenge you in business or in life. So 
I, 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 I wouldn't say that would change my, my approach in particular. Uh, I remember when COVID hit, I was a bit fearful for, for a few days, a, a bit panicky. But then I realised like with everything else after the, the dust settles, things pretty much go back to normal and then we all have to adjust. Excellent. So there's a lot of brands that have come and gone, as I said. Um, I don't know if you remember, there was a website called catwalking.com. No. So catwalking.com basically was a website that was put together where you had a password and yeah. you could see all the collections of that season from okay. various designers across the world. Today we have Vogue.com, which right. is exactly the same thing, but on a massive scale. So mm. even within, um, or even just looking at that, there's yeah. a lot more designers, there's a lot more fashion houses, mm. and a lot more people are getting involved in the fashion industry. Sure. Are there any brands out there that excite you? I think I've, because I work with a lot of startups, uh, I probably work with about 200 startups a year in the fashion industry. And I would say my kind of personal preference is geared more towards the more established brands. So for me, uh, Burberry always excites me. Um, and then also Alexander McQueen, having worked in there in their in their technical room and worked with their technicians the stuff that they do is always pushing boundaries and i always need to remind myself as a designer to push boundaries so that's why i love mcqueen because you know it's a british brand um, i've been familiar with the mcqueen story um working internally within the the infrastructure so it's an inspiration to me because it's kind of like a long-term uh, goal that I'd like to be at the level of McQueen and Burberry and fly the flag for Sierra Leone and the UK. Excellent. So why did you start the EVC chat? Well, I, I started EVC chat because I, I'm a father of two daughters. So they, they already have a beautiful mum. She's very uh, inspiring. She's very hardworking, very organised. So I felt that I have a lot of control and a lot of, I guess, power as a designer and a business person to uh, help influence the next generation, starting with them in particular. And I just asked myself, who do I know around me that I'd want these two young ladies to be inspired by? And I, I, I realised that I, I know so many women that are doing really creative um they're just at such a high level. So I just emailed these women. I think I emailed about 30 of them and then we're about halfway through interviewing them. And sitting down with each of these women and them sharing their stories, there's aspects of their lives I, I, I didn't know anything about. Some of them I've known for 20 years. And I'm someone that I watch um, people's careers from, from the, the background. I won't kind of bother them. I'll just monitor their progress and I guess that's my way of support. And um, I felt as a designer, it's my way of appreciating what they've done, celebrating what they've done, um, and letting them know that I believe in their story and, and, and I want to be part of their success so that um, I don't want to be one of those designers that chases after the celebrities. I want to be the designer that uh, works with these women and as they are on the come up, I'll be on the come, come up as well. So when the, ne the next Michelle Obama or Karen Brady, they know that Emil supported them through the journey. Excellent, excellent. So I want to talk a bit more about your, your personality mm. and who you are. So, as I said, I've had the pleasure of knowing you now for six years, yeah. and I know you in a, in a working capacity, yeah. and I also know you in a personal capacity. Yeah. Um, and I personally feel that you are a very confident person. You're confident in what you do, yeah. and you're confident in who you are. Um, Internally, mm. is that a true statement? Yeah, I'd, I'd say um, I'm confident. I think some of it is is I bluff my way through things. I I've made so many mistakes in my career that I've, I'm just at a point where I'm just fearless. And the only fear that does come is when it's going to affect my household. If yeah, if I make a decision that I know it's going to affect my household. Um, if it's not that, then I'm not really bothered about 
the, the, a, a, a mistake being made as a result of what, what I do because you can always try again and there's no shame in that. Um, and in my history, I've, I've overcome, you know, one of my worst fears. So after you overcome that, then as long as it doesn't affect your liberty or your health, then you, you just try and try again. You get knocked down, you get up. So yeah, as I say, I'm very confident. I'm very, because I've done what I do for so long. Um, I feel I am an authority in the fashion industry uh, because I, I, I pretty much have, not all, but I've seen so much. And uh, through me still surviving, I guess that gives me credibility to advise and be um, uh, forthright in, in the th my thinking and the way I talk. Nice, nice. You mentioned that the worst thing has happened. Mm, yeah. Would you mind sharing? Yeah, sure. I mean, I, I remember there was... Um, uh, years ago, we were living in Battersea and, uh, and we drove past Wandsworth Prison and I said to my sister, if, if I ever end up in prison, just forget about me because <laughs> it was just like, it, it was so far from like my character or where anybody would ever see me. And um, through a series of events, uh, partially at fault, partially not, um, I had to do four months on remand uh, where I, I pretty much lost everything, and it was um, a very, a very humbling, a very shocking time. And one either bounces back from that, or they go further down the rabbit hole. Mm. Because I know this experience that you're talking yeah. about, I I just wanted you to share a little bit more as to how okay. that happened, because it wasn't a straightforward ass. You made it seem, was okay. it? Okay, no, no, there was, yeah, there's a lot of caveats involved. I, I mean, um, I, I've, I've always been um, focused on my work and achieving. And when you're that kind of tunnel vision, sometimes you make decisions that compromise your, uh, your values. And uh, I mean, I had uh, good friends that I've known for years. We went to school together and they were doing some stuff on the side where we decided to go into business together. And at the time I'd got quite large contracts from Topshop and ASOS and all this, and op opportunities to go to New York and do fashion week over there. And those things, they cost a lot of money. You know, I didn't have rich parents um, and I wasn't, I was nowhere near rich myself. So I made the decision to have them as part of the business and kind of take money from them to, to, to fund certain aspects of the business to grow. And that was their initial intention, just to grow the business. It was never anything but that. And then um, something completely unrelated to the business happened where my, my business partner got in trouble. And at the time, uh, there was a initiative that called a joint enterprise. And so that meant that anybody that you were associated with on a business level or a friendship level, if there was the tiniest kind of connection there you all went along for the ride and as we were, we were both directors of the same company I got swept up I think two weeks after he got got arrested uh, I had to go and well I was advised to go and a comment by my brief um, because based on what they had you know we'd lived together we'd known each other since we were I think we were 12 it, it was all circumstantial evidence that the the police had but had I talked, it would, I guess, labelled me as kind of telling on him. And then for me not to talk, it, it was a loosely situation, but it was a situation I'd partially got myself in, um, but then I wasn't guilty of what they were charging me for. So I just had to uh, go no comment. Um, there, were, there was a lot of weird stuff that happened in the interview where they'd even taken my ledger of customer um, transactions and said that, oh, these notes where a customer had owed me money was uh, a person that I, I I was selling drugs to, which is so far fetched. But as you can't you can't talk at the time, they they the they as in the police they they kind of run with the story until your legal team have a chance to defend you in court, and that that for me took four months. And then eventually, after all the evidence got released, where there was no DNA, there was no financial. Uh, so that, that, that they were able to prove. I, I got released the day before my trial and I was looking at, I think it was five to seven years, had I gone to trial and been found not guilty, which could have happened because of the circumstances of evidence and I'd gone no comment. So to then 
kind of start talking in your trial, it looks guilty. So I got released out of Wandsworth Prison, ironically enough, the day before my trial was meant to start. So um, I definitely a sceptic for that one. I think that's a life-changing moment for you. Yeah, and, certainly. And I feel that there's some people out there that learn through other people's experiences yeah. and there's people that learn through their own experiences. Mm. I would like to hope that people listening to this will be able to take something from what you've just said and yeah. actually learn something. So on that note, mm. would you, is there any advice that you would give to that young person that's you know trying to inject money into their business and maybe is affiliated maybe possibly with the wrong type of people or, right you know just guilty by association well before i answer that question one thing to say if you are caught up in that in that situation is that there's still an opportunity to um bounce back and kind of redeem yourself because what i fortunately was able to do is i was first at Worm scrubs and Weber Scrubs had this um, uh, textiles workshop where you can go and you can sew. The the prison has, um, they make their own blankets, um, beddings, and they take on contracts for other um, businesses outside of the prison. So that's what I was able to do to just pass time and earn money. I think it was like £20 a week, which is ridiculous. But it, in that in that environment, it's it's a big deal. You're doing it for the time, not, not the money. Um, to answer your question in terms of oh, if people are, is it in this situation or about to? Yeah, I just feel that potentially there's a lot of maybe young black men, right. or black women or, or minorities generally that yeah. might find themselves in, in situations that aren't necessarily um, their fault. Yeah. Um, but yet still, due to circumstances, mm. is where they find themselves. So yeah. what advice and how can you know, they turn that around? Well, the, the reality is it will catch up with you at some point. That is a fact. Um, whether you end up in prison, you end up severe, severely beaten up by some very dangerous people, or you end up dead. Um, the, the, there were many points where um, we could have been kind of, um, that situation could have happened with us, and it would have been far worse. Um, so just know that for sure, it, it, it will, it, everything has, has an end. Um, what you can do is, uh, I guess, create what's called an exit strategy. Like, how are you going to get out of this? And you either use, I think there's a guy called Sheldon Thomas. Um, and it, correct me if I'm wrong, he was an ex-offender. And now he's uh, mentoring a lot of younger people who are in that situation because he was and he's able to speak to them directly um kind of see past their situation and i guess what i've been able to do over the years is um i've worked with needs who are not in employment education or training um not only explain my situation to them but show them that that there is a way that you can um, lose absolutely everything and then work your way back up. I was very fortunate. Where I have a very um, strong family unit. My, my mum and dad, they were very supportive. Um, my sister was like, me and my sister are twins, essentially. Like, she wasn't even going to gonna get married the, the year that my situation happened because there was a chance I was going to do five years for it. Um, so having that support system really helps. And, and I guess for those that, that don't, I think that that's partly the, the root of the problem because they don't have a core family kind of to support them. Um, so they look for that outside kind of um, camaraderie. Uh, so I, I think it's having pride that the hard slog is the real win, not the, not the short-term gain. So, obviously, we've now discussed the pits of yeah. having this business. Now, tell me a bit about the peak of having this business and how that's affected your confidence. Uh, I, think, I think the peak is, is always um, entering into something that you've got no business doing and just seeing if you can make it work. And that's pretty much what I do every day. Um, I sometimes take on jobs that I haven't quite got the experience for. But I know that with the right team around me, I can execute the, the job because I'm very much a person that can um, 
manage teams. Um, so the, the only instance where I won't take on a job if I feel the rapport with the individual isn't right. Because having done this for so long, I feel that I, I want to go home and be able to rest. Because there's a, there, there's a lot of pressure in this role. Um, I don't want to be looking over my shoulder because I've you know, pissed off the wrong person. So, um, yeah, and then it's about um, building. It's about knowing that um, I can even go out to my wife and say that um, this is what I've done today. Um, and, yeah, just I, I guess this is how I kind of contribute to help my family grow. Excellent, excellent. So you spoke about home there. So we're yeah. going to bring it a bit more back to the family. Um, so you seem to be very in control at work. Mm. But what happens when you go home? Are you are you <laughs> the guy that runs things, or like what's how does it work at home? No, I, I think I, by the time I get home, I'm just exhausted, and um, I kind of revert into slightly not lazy mode, but because my wife is very organized at home i'm just happy to let her just just do whatever and, and trust in her decision making um which i guess sometimes does annoy her because it, it seems as if i'm not interested but it's just the exhaustion of the day i don't want to have to be the control person at work and then do that at home because then there's there's no there's no switch off so um yeah i, I like to see home as as a sanctuary not a place where i'm a boss number two. Excellent. So, as a younger man, mm. before you got married, yeah. was getting married and having a family a priority? Like, was it something you worked towards? No, it wasn't actually. I think I, up until I got, up until my sister got married, I didn't really see the kind of importance in marriage. Um, the, the things I, I, I was previously engaged to someone years ago and that was a that was a very odd uh, situation to be in because you know we eventually broke it off and and that was that was so the right thing to do because naturally I met Sade and, and now we're married 10 years down down the line um but I, I I guess very later on I kind of saw the importance of marriage which was weird because my parents they've been married for what was it 37 years now so I definitely had a great example at home um, I think maybe um, I wasn't quite ready to appreciate uh, what marriage was. So, as a father and a married man, bringing up two girls yeah. of Afro-Caribbean descent, what are three things you would like to leave with them as independent women when they leave your home? Well, number one, uh, I always tell Nia to uh, walk with her, her head held held up, even though she's she might be in the wrong, it's fine. Um you know, if you look at kind of like uh, leaders of the world, even when they're in the wrong, they're still very confident. They're very forthright. Uh, and when you, when you kind of have your head held down and your your shoulders scratch, scr scrunching, and then it permeates through everything else. And then uh, I always tell her um, it's okay to make mistakes. I told both of them that. And actually, and actually, Brielle doesn't quite understand yet because she's uh, one and a half. But um, Nia tends to uh, get very irate and frustrated very quickly if she gets something wrong. And I almost want her to get something wrong just so she understands that life does not work in a way where everything's 10 out of 10. Um, you will make mistakes, it's okay. You just, you just brush it off, you start again. And I think the third thing would be... Um, I'm not sure if this is an overlap, but having conviction in their decision making, um, being their own person. The last thing I generally say to Nia when I drop her off to school in the morning is be you, be brilliant, be kind. And she relays that back to me. So um, the, the rest is literally up to them. So um, there's this analogy in marriage mm. and it's, um, or even generally in, in relationships, yeah. generally, um, rhinos and uh rhinos and hedgehogs okay <laughs> how do you deal with conflict generally oh um I, I think with conflict i tend to just go quiet I, I tend to kind of probably clam up um 
and I, and I think it probably stems from how I reacted when I was younger because I've recently started counselling, so I've um, been made aware of how I deal with conflict. I'm not someone that shouts. Um, I'm not someone that that is very kind of um, elaborate in, in my movements. I'll just kind of just, and that's it. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, so recently, I'd say more recently, as a nation, and probably even further afield, you know, there's been a lot of talk about anxiety yeah. and mental health. Mm. And um, you mentioned off camera, or you mentioned just now that you've started counselling. So, yeah. how's that going? It, it certainly helps because um, I, I think what counselling has helped me do is is find the the root of things. Even though we're early in the process, uh, looking at certain aspects of uh, certain childhood experiences, be it school, you know, I went through a short period where I got bullied, and how that had an effect on even me now. Um, it's, I, 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 I try and go to the gym and the spa quite regularly, uh, just to make sure I have time to myself because that routine of picking up the kids and dropping them off, that is very hectic. Has your upbringing and migration to the UK from Sierra Leone at such a young age mm. um, affected or inspired the way you raise your your daughters and the way you interact with your wife at home? Yeah, the thing is, I'm sure it has. Um, I'm not quite sure how to articulate it. I would probably say that um, you know, I definitely love to take the, the girls and my wife to Sierra Leone because uh, I've been there a few times. It's a beautiful country. There's a lot of um, kind of just richness. There's fresh food, um, seeing like where my mum and dad live because they've got a house over there. Uh, I haven't had the chance to share that experience with my family yet, but um, yes, would be the answer to your question. Yeah. So, Mel, we're going to do a quick fire round. Okay. I want you to answer these questions right. in a statement as quickly <laughs> as possible sure. um, to give me the most honest right. answer. So, sports or music? Music. Get up early or go to bed late? I'm definitely a riser. <laughs> Who's your favourite designer? Too yeah, it, it, prob it probably is Alexander McQueen. Okay. Pattern cutting or garment construction? Garment construction. What would you change about yourself? Nothing. <laughs> Say a four-letter word beginning with P. Oh, God, you're going to get in trouble. <laughs> say it, say uh, it, say it, say it. Pine and pine, I don't know. <laughs> Excellent. I thought you were going to say something else. <laughs> Staying in. Or going out? Uh, staying in, yeah. Instagram or TikTok? Instagram. Cooking or takeout? It depends what. The thing I prefer... Uh, Charlie's going to cast. Um, <laughs> cooking. <laughs> okay. Right. So, in closing, Emil, um, I'm sure you've answered this question a mm. hundred times before, yeah. but I'm going to put a spin on it. What advice would you give to the teenage boy mm. who has migrated from West Africa mm. and wants to start a fashion business in his adolescent years as he's just leaving his teenage years? Mm. It's interesting. I, I think one of the key things is, is have fun with it. Uh, definitely try and incorporate some of your culture don't seek the approval of anyone um because that will kind of just ruin things and wear what you make because one of the um best things i ever did was this wearing what i'd made and having that pride of of wearing your own creation. And because I'm generally a quiet person, so when I go out, even if I'm not quite 100% on what I'm wearing, someone will identify that what I'm wearing is different, and then they'll ask me, where did you get that from? And that a, a conversation starts from there, and I can talk for ages about my work, but I can't, I'm not the kind of person to kind of, kind of go to you and say, oh, hey, I'm a Mills, so and so I can't do that. So I kind of, let my work do the, the talking for me and then um, I've hopefully won you in that way. 
Perfect. So, that's an example. Today, you are wearing one of your pieces. Yeah, yeah, Tell yeah. Tell me a bit about that. Because, obviously, you're a women's wear designer. Yes. And, clearly, you're not wearing a women's jacket. Yeah. <laughs> so, how did this one come about? Well, I've got, uh, like, some blocks I use for, 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 my, for my shape. And um, I, I, I always use the concept um, pattern for my collections. I make a jacket out of it just as a, something commemorative. So I've got this in, I've got this jacket in probably five or six different versions. I was just at the Black British Business Awards a couple of weeks ago where I was one of the judges and I wore, this is the wrong side of the fabric. So the jacket I wore to the awards, that was a good side of the fabric. So um, yeah, I tend to keep my, my style quite simple, generally in a white shirt, black trousers, and then the jacket is not loud, but very vibrant and, um, and charismatic. Excellent. Emil, it really has been an honour and a pleasure to meet you. I'm looking forward to the next six years, after mm. the last six years of knowing you. Yeah. Um, and I look forward to every business venture that you're going to go into in the future. Cool. Thank you so much. Cool. For Thanks, Andrew. Today. Thank you.